The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kara. I'm with the LTAP Center here at ODOT, and I will be your host for this webinar. Today's webinar is Drinking Water and Wastewater Solutions for Communities, and we're thrilled to have Pam Ewing as the presenter. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items to ensure a smooth webinar experience for everyone. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the questions panel on your screen. You can type your questions there and we'll address them during the Q&A session at the end. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties or have any other issues, feel free to use the chat panel to communicate with our team and we'll do our best to assist you. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to all registered attendees after the session via email. All right, with that out of the way, let's get started. It's my pleasure to hand it over to Pam Ewing. Pam, the virtual floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Kara, for inviting me to speak today. Um, as technical assistance providers, we're always looking for ways to reach out to communities, and so hopefully today we can pick up a few more that don't know about our programs. As Kara mentioned, my name is Pam Ewing. I am a senior rural development specialist with the RCAP programs in Ohio. I have been with RCAP for 15 years. Prior to that, I worked with the uh, USDA Rural Development as a loan specialist in the field of um, water and sewer, as well as community facilities. So let's get started here. So my goal today is for you to understand what funding programs are available here in Ohio for water and sewer projects, uh, learn about the RCAP technical assistance that's available to assist you, and then what access uh, methods are available for training courses that we provide. So what is RCAP? Um, the Rural Community Assistance Program, or partnership, is a group of nonprofits that form a national net RCAP network that serves all 50 states as well as Puerto Rico. Ohio is part of the Great Lakes region, which, is, which also includes the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Most of our staff are home-based. I'm located in Millersburg, Ohio, which is located in Holmes County, and we're all scattered around the state, which makes it pretty easy for us to reach you know, communities all over the place. Uh, we're available to assist communities under a population of 10,000, but our customer base is usually much, much smaller than that. We're usually in the low thousands is who we're out there assisting the most. So in Ohio, we have a staff of around 30 employees with varied past experiences, including banking, funding agencies like where I came from, city management, um, development districts, health departments, operators, and fiscal officers. So not only do we have a great knowledge base just here in Ohio, but we have access to hundreds of other um, RCAP employees around the country, as you can see by the map that's up here. Uh, we have a national office that's also located in Washington, DC. So the mission of RCAP is to improve the public health, surface water protection, environmental compliance, economic readiness, and quality of life in small communities and rural areas. And we achieve this by helping small and rural communities access funding for water and sewer projects, uh, improving the technical and managerial financial capabilities of the water and sewer systems through technical assistance and training. And we're also out here to promote a shared services between communities and regionalization projects to increase the economies of scale and efficiency to reduce those costs to the end users, which is our customers, and ensure long-term sustainability of the system. So the funders on this page here, uh, the USDA Rural Development, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, US EPA, Ohio Division of Drinking and Groundwaters, and the Ohio Water Development Authority are the funders of the RCAP programs. So we receive technical assistance grants through these agencies that allows us then to provide services to the small communities in Ohio. Um, 
without the support of these funders, we would not be in existence and able to provide the, the technical assistance that we have available. And our national office staff are continually pursuing funding to expand and enhance um, our programs and services and outreach to communities across the country. One of the largest components of RCAP technical assistance is meeting the funding requirements of the agencies that, that provide us the technical assistance. Um, we provide a mix of in-person webinar, online courses, uh, trying to reach those uh, community members that you know, have day jobs. Uh, some of you might be part-time, so we offer these uh, at off hours to hopefully get the, the word out to you. Um, RCAP provides regular courses geared for management that are related to financial and managerial aspects of, of a utility. And we have licensed operators on staff that provide technical and operational courses on a, on a regular basis. One of the more fun trainings is our annual field days, which we provide demonstrations on technical and operational issues uh, and aspects of the system management. And we have these once a year, and we kind of scatter them around the state. Operator contract hours are typically available for most of the operational and technical uh, sessions that we conduct. And you can keep up to date on our training opportunities by accessing our website, which I have the link on the screen. And later at the end of the program, there'll be um, QR codes that you can access to. So our website provides access to several safe, uh, self-paced training courses. Uh, the one to call attention to the ones highlighted in red, which is the 101 utility management and the 201 financial management courses. These two courses are designed for your boards and councils, and it is a requirement of EPA that, that at least 50% of the boards or councils attend these two sessions um, if they're receiving principal forgiveness funding through the EPA. So something to, to keep in mind, these are great courses to attend regardless of whether you're receiving, receiving principal forgiveness, but it is a requirement if you are. And certificates of completion uh, are, are provided to all people who, who complete the courses. So we have uh, several 2025 trainings that are in development right now. Um, these are gonna be a mixture of in-person and webinars. And the courses that are being planned for the next year are the current initiative of EPA and the other funding sources. So stay tuned for those schedules. Um, our field day this year is going to be held in the Bowling Green area, so keep your calendars open for May 14th and watch for updates and additional information on topics that will be presented during that time. Um, these are all great topics, but a couple that are current initiative of EPA is the lead and copper compliance and the project development and regionalization. And as you all know, public water systems were required to complete identification of service line materials by October 16th. And there are many more requirements to this initiative that's coming down the pike. So I highly recommend that uh, you watch for this session coming available and attend if you can do so. Uh, the project development and regionalization is currently scheduled for March 19th in Zanesville. It will be an in-person session. And this is another topic to know and understand. Uh, so mark your calendars for that one. We're gonna get a little bit more in depth uh, than we are today on the funding programs and their eligibility requirements, and then discuss what regionalization actually is and how it might affect you in the future if you're struggling with your system. So we recognize uh, the challenges of small community water and sewer systems. Um, you have the same issues as the larger systems. You just have the added burden of the economies of scale, the small customer base, uh, the loss of population, and along with that then the loss of jobs and, and, and revenues. Um, this results in a lack of the system revenues and, and the need for highly competitive grants to make your system sustainable. 
And the goal of our CAP programs is to provide the support and guidance to you to, to lessen that burden where we can. So in Ohio, we're actually one of the luckier states in the country. We have access to many more funding sources than what a lot of parts of the country have. Um, we just came back from a national conference in Omaha, Nebraska, and it was interesting to, to hear the other states talk about the lack of funding that we have, and we are really blessed here in Ohio. It may not feel like that when you're planning a project or trying to secure funding, but um, we actually do have many more. Of course, each one of these lenders on the screen um, have different processes, different schedules, different eligibility requirements. Um, so it's kind of hard to navigate that sometimes and know which one's the best to pursue. If your project schedule is flexible and you can meet um, eligibility requirements, there are ways to combine some of these sources I'm gonna talk about today to make your project a little bit more affordable, but you kind of have to be flexible, and kind of go with the schedule that they provide. So the ones listed on the screen here are probably ones that you're most familiar with or that you have used in the past. Um, so they're a mixture of federal and of course state uh, sources. Uh, the USDA is a federal program that provides loan and grant funding for larger water and sewer infrastructure projects. This agency also provides community facility funding for projects such as fire, police, hospitals, nursing homes, schools, you know, those types of community-based um, projects. And the EPA at Ohio uh, Department, or excuse me, Ohio Development Authority, um, in addition to providing funding for construction, they also have planning and design loans that are available. So these funds allow you to then develop your project and those short-term loans then roll into your construction financing. And in the OPWC, you're probably all familiar with that one, but it's also available for construction financing. But we have more in Ohio. So the sources listed on this page here are, are ones that are available that might take a little bit more effort or chance uh, and may only be available in certain parts of the of the state. So Ohio has 32 Appalachian counties along the eastern and southern regions of the state. This grant funding serves as a gap funding for your project and it's compatible with other funding sources. Uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers does select a few projects each year to fund through their Section 594 program. And attending a SCIG meeting, which we're going to discuss here in a little bit, will place your project on a potential project list. Um, you can't plan for this type of uh, this source of funding. It's, it just comes as a, as a surprise, so, which is a, a welcome surprise sometimes. But here again, your project kind of has to be flexible if this were to come in at a certain time during your planning or, or design because it, it is a lengthy process and it would delay your project a little bit. And EDA, Economic Development Administration, could be a possibility if you have a project that you're developing that's leaning towards business or industrial growth. Um, there have been a few that we've been successful in getting that in, but it just takes a lot of planning to also bring them in. And another, of course, is the congressional direct spending opportunities that come up every year through your local representatives. And just remember that this funding, while it's a grant, still runs through one of the funding agencies that we listed and discussed on the previous screen. And most require a match and all agency requirements must be followed. So some communities got taken by surprise when they receive a con congressional direct spending uh, grant, not, realize, not realizing that they're gonna be following typical agency requirements. So projects that are easier to fund with grants. And understandably, all communities want grants to reduce the financial burden on residents. Some communities just want grants or they're not gonna do the project. And others want grants that their neighbors got. But grants are highly competitive and actually scarce. And each funding source has different eligibility requirements and timelines. 
So just remember that no two communities or projects are the same. So your funding will not be the same either. And having a flexible project schedule can also help to secure grant sources. Um, so don't wait until the last minute to plan your project. We need to allow at least 18 months, 12 to 18 months to properly plan and determine what funding sources would be best advantageous to your project. So some of the sources that are easier to fund, of course, are those that address a compliance issue or a public health threat. Uh, regionalization projects where two, two or more communities are coming together to consolidate either their water or their sewer services. This is what the definition of regionalization is. Lead service line replacement, which is a hot topic right now. Um, combined sewer separation and sanitary sewer overflows. And then, of course, sewage backups into homes. So those are kind of the ones that would be easier to seek grant funding on. Still difficult. You still have to meet the eligibility requirements, but those are kind of the ones that's going to up your score a little bit when they're looking at the applications. So some of the ones that's going to be a little bit harder to fund with grants will be those that are basically maintenance type items, um, such as meter replacement, your tower painting, um, filter media replacement, purchase of equipment, trucks, backhoes, et cetera. Um, these are items that are considered maintenance. So you're probably going to be borrowing on those versus receiving grants. And what's important here is that um, knowing this, that you should be incorporating those, re incorporating those repair and replacement into your operating budgets. Um, it's a necessity to set funds aside to, you know, maybe not eliminate the need for borrowing, but reduce the borrowing if you can do so, um, which will ultimately affect your customers. And we're going to get into a little bit later talking about asset management planning for water systems, but um, that plan does require budgeting and requiring reserve accounts. So if you're following your asset management plan, setting aside is, is one of the requirements. USDA, if you have a USDA loan or will be pursuing a loan through them, um, they're also a lender that requires a percentage of revenues be set aside for debt service reserve and short-lived assets. So just remember, maintenance type items, you need to save as much as you can. Grants are going to be very, very scarce. So let's get into a little bit about the free resources that are available through RCAP. And one of the ones that is the most used is uh, our assistance in project development and, and determining funding strategy strategies. Um, we can come into your community and help you determine um, what funding sources are the best for you, what's going to provide you the, the best alternative for funding out there, and we can prepare all the funding applications and act as, as a facilitator between you and your funding agencies, which takes the stress off of your staff, which in most cases are part-time. So us taking a lead as a facilitator and kind of working with you kind of relieves that stress a little bit. But be sure to get us involved early in the process so that we can maximize those funding opportunities and work with you and your consultant on, on your project schedule. You can access our website for a couple of spreadsheets that are, are very nice to use when you're doing your, your project development. One is the RCAP funding grid, which provides a detail of each of the funding programs and provides uh, links to each of those agencies. Um, our funding scenario spreadsheet is available to help you determine the best and worst case financing scenarios. Uh, this spreadsheet allows you to enter the project cost and develop you know, differences between uh, funding strategies that fit your project schedule and provides a view of how those, that funding strategy will affect the end result on your customers. Um, and again, I'm going to repeat this many times, but the more flexible your schedule, the more opportunities that there may be depending on the type of project and the location of your project. But you can access our website for these. Um, our website has a lot of information on there that, that we share with communities, and you can download them at no cost. 
So do you have a consultant for your project? The Ohio Revised Code actually requires that public entities follow a qualified base selection process uh, when hiring consultants. And hiring the best consultant to meet your needs is actually one of the most important aspects of your project. If you've never been through this, pro this process before, it can be intimidating for smaller communities. But just remember that we're out here to help you through that. Uh, we also have templates available uh, for the solicitation and interview processes. So give us a call if you need assistance in hiring a consultant. And when you're doing your interview process, ensuring that you hire an engineer that works well with you and understands your system's needs is going to be very important for the success of your project. And just as a reminder, we get asked this a lot. RCAP works with any um, engineering firms in Ohio that you might select. Um, we just look forward to being part of your team and helping you um, get the most affordable project to your community. So if you need help with hiring that consultant, or don't understand the process, you know, give us a call and we can help you with that. So meet the SCIG. What is the SCIG? The SCIG is a small communities environmental infrastructure group, and it's a group of all the major funders in Ohio, and they come together six times a year. They hold these uh, meetings virtually nowadays since COVID that kind of changed things. We went from in-person to doing it virtually, which works just perfectly. Communities that are interested in taking their project before the SCIG are required to pre-register and complete a project information form. And you can access that form on the RCAP website um, and complete it and send it. Um, it'll give you instructions on where to send it, but it comes back to RCAP and then RCAP will schedule, schedule you in for that, that SCIG meeting. So you come to the SCIG meeting virtually and you take 15, 20 minutes to explain your project, the issues that you're having with your, with your system. And then each of the lenders then will speak up and provide comments as to eligibility requirements that you might meet and make any recommend, uh, recommendations to improve the project competitiveness. Um, so it's, it's a nice little group to go before if you have a project that is, you know, a large or multi-phased or controversial or involves regionalization with another local community and you need guidance on how to proceed through that process. Um, it's just a great opportunity to give an outline so that the lenders know that you're out there and that this might be coming forward and, and they can provide you some good access as to what's available. And by attending a SCIG meeting, it also places you, your project on a list for potential funding through the Army Corps. Uh, a few times a year, they'll come to the uh, SCIG and ask for a list of projects that are sitting out there waiting for funding, and then they select from those from that list. Not every, not every project needs to go before the SCIG, but if you've got the larger, multi-phase, kind of difficult ones, those are the best ones to take. So another service that RCAP provides is um, environmental assessments. And um, this is a service that's on a fee basis. Um, and each of the lenders on this screen are, are some of the assessments that we can complete. Each one of them has a different format and a different process, and we're familiar with each one of them. We do them on a regular basis. So if you need a quote, call us early in your funding process so that your project is not delayed by the environmental process. Um, before we can start at least a scope of work or a copy of the preliminary engineering report, and project maps must be provided to us so that we kind of get you know, the, the, the full range of what your project is impacting so that we can do a, a good environmental assessment up front and not have to have any revisions to that. And understand that environmental assessments can take three to four months to complete and sometimes longer if you have additional surveys that are required such as archeological surveys or wetland delineations. So, um, just keep that in mind when you're planning your project. And if you do need help, but give us a call on that. If you're receiving financing through one of the EPA programs, either their water or sewer program, the EPA completes their own environmental assessment and it's not the responsibility of the community. So 
So a little bit ago and a few slides before we mentioned asset management. So asset management plans have been a requirement by EPA since 2018 for all public water systems. Your asset management plan is a living document. It was not just a one or done. It was, it's living. So you need to be reviewing it and revising that at least annually or as needed. This plan will contain the water utilities written policies and procedures, your financial forecast, your capital improvement planning, contingency plans, your maintenance tax task procedures, the condition assessment of your system, and your system mapping. So it's, it's, a, it's a large document of information. And EPA requires uh, an asset capability review um, for your project prior to receiving funding through, through the EPA. So um, that would be something that to keep in mind if you're seeking EPA funding, you need to be sure that your asset management plan is up to date. So I've provided a link here to the uh, EPA's website that obtains, obtains a lot of information regarding the asset management process. And then also a link to the RCAP national website, which uh, has a lot of webinar archives on there, um, e-learning videos, uh, procurement and purchasing policy templates, uh, operator resources. There's a financial hub on there that gives you directions on how to you know, plan financially, uh, guidebooks, and there's, there's just a lot of information on that site. So take a look at that when you get the time. It might be some valuable information on there for you. So most communities have some form of an asset management plan, but maybe portions of it need some improvement. Um, RCAP has what we call an asset management cohort, where we can guide you th and your team through the improvements to your plan. Um, we think it's beneficial um, that you kind of have a skin in the game, but there's somebody doing it for you so that you understand the process and can implement what you need to implement for your community. Um, we can meet virtually or in person, depending on your needs, uh, to conduct this guidance. And recently, here in just the past few weeks, we've been receiving several calls from communities requesting assistance to revise their asset management plan after EPAs reviewed them and found deficiencies in the plan. So if you had used the EPA's template that was found on their website, when you first developed your asset management plan. You just need to be sure that you have the detailed uh, policies and procedures to back up that plan. In other words, that template itself was not enough. You need to have those, those backup documents to support it. And I think I, I'm just seeing kind of some tendencies here where some of the policies and procedures are kind of lacking and that's where they're coming back at you. And another area that, that we're hearing might not be sufficient is the condition assessment and knowing the age and the materials of the infrastructure, even the underground materials. Um, and this is some areas that you'd probably need some outside assistance on. We'll get through a few more slides here and I'll give you some resources that RCAP has available to maybe help you with that as well. But if you do need help with your asset management plan um, updates, just give us a call. Um, we are busy, so assistance might not occur immediately, but we're definitely gonna work with you on a schedule to get you worked in for that assistance. Rate setting. Now, I'm sure this is one of everybody's favorite topic, right? So just a few things to, to remind you of is that rates should cover the full cost of operations. I'd mentioned previously on some other screens, having rates sufficient to cover those set asides and reserves. And that's highly recommended for those repair and replacement projects. So your rates need to be at a level that you can do that. Um, automatic rate adjustments, annual rate adjustments are a great idea. It prevents council from having to go through this process every year and arguing about whether rates need to be adjusted or not. So having that, that ordinance in place that just automatically sets by a certain percentage each year is a fantastic idea and it's something that we really that we really push communities towards. And remember, low rates equals less grant. 
if your rates aren't being maintained uh, and in line with the funding agency requirements, it will result in borrowing for your improvements versus receiving grant funding. So your, 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 your rates are the competitive part of the grants. So RCAP does have a staff that are just dedicated to rate studies. We are extremely busy with these, as you can imagine. And so if you need a rate study, um, give us a call and we can work in the schedule with you. Um, our rate studies are on a fee basis. And in some cases, there may be a grant program that we can roll your community in if we have a grant available. So always check and see whether we do or, or if we have something like that available for you. And the link on the screen here is to our national RCAP. And again, I mentioned before, it has information in there regarding rate setting. Uh, the Formulate Great Rates, great rates is a guidebook that's on that site that you can access. It kind of walks you through some of the, the steps of having good rates set in place. So some other RCAP services that we have are GIS and condition assessment. Um, we have a, a team of people that that is their sole duties. And they have had a very busy year this year conducting a service line inventory for small communities around the state. Uh, and this work will continue as the EPA's lead and copper rule continues to evolve. Um, staff travel the state conducting GIS mapping, smoke testing, inspection of sewers, of the water systems, manholes, and basically overall condition of your utility. These services also are on a fee-based, and again, at times there are grants that can be enrolled, your project can be enrolled under, that would either lessen the cost or be at no cost for you, so something to keep in mind. And we're always based on uh, the availability of staff, but if you have a flexible project schedule and can give us a call to discuss how we might be able to work you in or what we might be able to help you, that would be recommended. But these are, these are great resources and a very extremely busy group of people out there right now doing this stuff. So we have operators, we have uh, water and sewer licensed operators on staff with RCAP, and it was a, a great addition when those guys started being hired. It allows us then to assist the smaller communities if they're having operational issues or they need violations that need to be eliminated. Um, these guys can come out and assist your operator in working through those violations and, and getting rid of those. Um, they also develop operator training on a very regular basis. So again, watch our website for notification of those. And another area that they provide assistance in is writing the operational procedures, such as your contingency plan, your valve exercising plans, hydrant flushing, they can come out and help you with those. If you need your contingency plan exercised, we have staff that can help you with exercises to meet the requirements of EPA on your contingency plan exercising. So if you're having operational issues, you know, give us a call. Let's get one of these guys out there. Again, they're very busy. They're roaming the state. So we'll work you into the schedule as quickly as we can. So we have a couple of outreach materials uh, that, that come out. I think some of them come quarterly. And these are publications that provide um, it's kind of how-to and, and success stories from around the country. It's kind of interesting to, to read how other states, what condition their water and sewer systems are in and what kind of challenges that they have versus what we have here in Ohio. So great access materials for this. You can contact or get on our website here and subscribe for those. Um, publications if you'd like to have those. And I kind of want a speed course here, but so just wrapping up here a little bit with some of my comments and then I'll open it up for any questions that you might have. We, we always like to remind communities that your utilities are your largest and most valuable assets. And maintaining those utilities are difficult 
it's very expenses, expensive and sometimes just not understood or valued by the customers that you serve. Um, and we know that there are setbacks and delays. I think we've probably all experienced those from outside sources that delay your projects, whether it's you know the not available of funding or just being scared to go for the funding or needing the grants and not being sure that you qualify for the grants or you know not knowing how to hire an, uh, an engineer and going through that design planning and design phase uh, so there's a lot of things that can derail your project but the goal is to be flexible so that you can increase the odds of maximizing those funding opportunities and to take advantage of the technical assistance that's out there for you and um, public education is huge um, most of the funding agencies now are requiring evidence that you've notified the public of the project that you're working on. So whether that's through a series of public meetings, if it's a larger type project or uh, controversial, um, if you're considering a regionalization project, you definitely want to have public meetings from the very beginning of that process and throughout and then end it with you know, informing the public of, of how it went and when everything's going to take place. Um, this is just a, a way to keep your customers involved um, and understanding what you're doing with the utility. Um, you know, there's uh, on the web, on the uh, RCAP's website, there's probably access to templates. If you like to have templates for um, notifying your, your community by newsletters or, you know, if you can put them on your billing notices, but keeping your public involved is becoming a more important aspect of project planning than what I think it probably has been in the past. In the past. So if you, if you need our cap assistance, please reach out to us. Like I said, we're, we're busy. We have you know, the GIS and the condition assessment team that's just out there on the ground all the time. Rate studies are huge. Uh, we do rate studies um, just at the request of the community that might be struggling a little bit with how to develop rates a rate structure that's maybe, you know, equitable to all customers, not just a certain group of customers, such as businesses. Uh, we can help you develop that base rate and that variable rate to be sure that you're, that you've got the most equitable rate possible for your communities. Uh, we use rate studies quite a bit for regionalization projects right at the very beginning to look at whether, you know, what's the most feasible option? What's to keep your project or your system sustainable? So rate studies are kind of an important um, tool, financial tool, as you're going through that. So, you know, keep us in mind for things like that. Get us involved, you know, early in the process so that we can, you know, we can be right there with you from the very beginning. And then we've got your QR, QR codes here. I tested them. They should work. So hopefully they do for you. And it will give you access to join our email list. Um, it'll take you to our web pages. And we're also on Facebook if you'd like to follow us there. And the 800 number um, to reach us is you can call that 800 number. It takes you into our Fremont office and um, they, will, they will get it out to us as a referral. We usually respond within three days of the referral request. So you know, give us a call if you if you have any issues or concerns, and I will open it up to questions. So fire away. Wonderful, Pam. Thank you so much for that incredible and, and informative presentation. Right now, we do have only one question. So if anyone has questions, go ahead and get those in. Um, the question right now um, says, local agencies seeking funding always seem to ask this difficult question. What is the average time interval between application and receipt of funds and or beginning of construction if awarded? Well, that's a loaded question. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the funding source that you're applying to. Each, again, each of these sources have different policies and procedures that you have to go through. For instance, if you were going to the, if you determine that EPA would be your best funding source, EPA does require a nomination. So for water projects, you nominate your project uh, typically in March of every year. 
And then there's within that nomination form, there is a project schedule that you complete. And then you kind of go through that schedule by submitting your applications, your design plans. It gives you exact dates is when this information is required to be received by EPA in order to maintain your project schedule. Now, when you're working in other funding sources into along with the EPA, then it kind of maybe skews that project schedule a little bit, and you can always work with EPA to adjust it. If you were going to EPA for sewer funding for a sewer project, then you would nominate that project in typically either August or September, whenever they release the nomination forms, and the same method works. You have that project schedule within your nomination form that you're, that you're looking to maintain. But again, if you're trying to bring in other sources, it could kind of skew it a little bit. Um, the USDA funding, it's a federal program, so it is a little bit more lengthy, a great program because it can provide a longer term loan up to 40 years, and it also has the grant assistance. So um, it is an online application, and they are dependent upon a federal budget. So when October 1st every year rolls around, they need to have that federal budget in place in order to kind of keep your project moving forward. If not, then they kind of have to wait until they get, um, you know, either a, a budget passed or a contingent resolution in place. Um, so kind of a loaded question. Uh, you could probably say at least 12 months by the time you apply and then receive funding. Um, but it just depends on, on the size of your project, the other lenders that you might be trying to drag in to kind of leverage those different funding sources that you have in it. Um, and if you were lucky enough to receive Army Corps funding, that depending on when it's received, again, it comes as a surprise. So depending on it was received, it could delay your project even further because it is a lengthy process that requires um, an environmental assessment, which is a which is a long process, but um, it's a great source of funding as well. So if you're lucky enough to receive it, you just have to be flexible with that schedule. So I hope I answered that question, but it's um, it just kind of depends. There's no direct answer to that, but I would say at least 12 months by the time you apply and receive. Wonder, great answer, Pam. That was that was very in depth and very appreciated. I'm sure. Um, we have another question, um, and this one's definitely a much shorter one. Um, this person just, just wants to know when is the in-person training in the Zanesville area? So the in-person training for the project development and regionalization is March 19th, and we'll be getting information out that here shortly. We just got the venue um, secured. We're in the process of doing that. So. Um, I think it's like a four hour course. It's going to start at nine in the morning. So we'll just watch our website and we'll get some notices out to the, the final on that. But um, just to reiterate, uh, the project development portion of that, we'll get into a little bit more in depth on these funding sources that are out there, kind of get more into their schedules and their eligibility requirements. And then the regionalization um, is an important topic that um, it's becoming more and more popular as these very small systems are just finding out that they're not sustainable alone. And so we're going to discuss about ways that you can either share resources with a, a local community, um, such as, uh, you know, doing bulk chemical purchases or sharing equipment, sharing operators, um, sharing billing. Um, there's ways that you can do shared services that kind of lessens the burden on these really small places. And then going the full shebang where you're actually regionalizing or consolidating with a nearby community. So it's it should be a good session. That sounds wonderful. Another. And yeah, maybe Another. if um, we could also ask um, attendees to join the email list using the um, QR code on the screen, that way they would Correct. get a notification for that. Correct, yes, please do so. And another one that I really wanted to mention was the uh, the upcoming ones. It's going to be in May. I don't have an exact date yet in May, but it's the fiscal officer training, and it's called the fiscal officer boot camp. And we started this last summer, and it was extremely well received because there's not 
much funding or training courses out there for your physical staff, your physical officers. Um, and so uh, we have a couple of physical officers on our staff that thought, you know, this would be a great resource and, and it has been, it's been very well received. So I think uh, this year's course is going to be more on um, defining what a performa is, how to, how to financially forecast your utility. And we just kind of got our toes into it this past a session this summer and people wanted more. So that's kind of going to be what the boot camp is this year. So keep your fiscal officers aware of May um, and we'll get you the exact date again as that's actually um, you know, developed and planned, but that, that's a great one to come to as well. And as well as that um, lead and copper compliance, um, huge additional items that's still gonna be required on, on your water systems uh, as, this, as this initiative develops. So, um, be aware of, of that training coming out, and that would be a great one to also attend so that you're not missing any of the requirements that's coming down on that rule. Wow, so much to look forward to. Thank you, Pam. Okay, we have not had any more questions come in. So- I was waiting for um, the questions. I know, you, you told everybody everything they needed to know. Everybody just is very well informed now, which is, you know, <laughs> a great presentation. Um, so, yeah. Was there, any, was, was there any areas that anybody would like me to kind of go a little bit more in depth since we have a few minutes or? Yeah, um, we can, anybody, if anybody has anything where they would like a little bit more detail or extra information, I am going to, um, I'll just let everyone know while we're on here that I will um, hopefully be sending out um, the um, the actual website addresses for the um, links that you um, had in your presentation that I will also send out with the recording um, and the PDF um, okay. of your um, presentation so that, you know, um, our attendees can rewatch. And then if they have more questions, um, they could reach out to you. Would that be okay? That would be great. Yep. Okay. Very good. And remind me, did you have your contact information? I did not. Oh, We're using the uh, 800 number there, and you can just ask if you want somebody specific, but they asked that we do it that way. Okay. Um, that sounds so great. So just reach out to that 800 number, and we'll get back with you. Within three days, that's a requirement. So we should be able to get back with you quickly on that. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, well, hopefully everyone takes you up on that offer because that's <laughs> a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I see any new questions. So I okay. feel um, our participants have been um, learned a lot from this um, presentation that you shared with us. So I really appreciate you taking the time to um, be with us today and share that information. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the recording of this webinar, along with the PDF of, your, of the presentation will be shared with all registers, registered attendees via email. Um, and so on behalf of LTAP and ODOT, I'd like to thank you, Pam, once again, for sharing your valuable knowledge and expertise with us. Um, and I would also like to thank all of our attendees for being here today. We hope you found this webinar informative and engaging, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.